Okay, Lisa, are you ready? Shall we start? Okay. Um, cool. Okay, so um, hello everyone. Welcome to another session of the One Word Probability Seminar. Um, without further ado, let me introduce today's speaker. So today we have the great pleasure to, um, to have Lisa Hampton, who will be speaking about the continuous random energy model. So um, the floor is yours, Lisa. Okay, thanks for the kind introduction and the invitation. Um, so this is actually going to be the first talk out of two. And the general idea is that I give a bit of the background, um, kind of yeah, the background picture. And then Maximilian is going to speak in more detail about one of our current projects together with uh, Oren Louis Dor. Um, the talks are independent from each other um, but, but still, I think it's a good combination to have them together. So um, the title of my talk is about the continuous random energy model and the two-dimensional DGFF. And my talk will be mainly focused on the first part and Maximilian's talk on the second one of this joint title. Um, so let me start. And the starting point of today's talk is the random energy model, which was at the um, beginning of the 80s introduced by Derrida as a toy model for spin glasses. And for us, this will be a collection of IID Gaussians. Um, yeah, and one way we might think of them is actually we take the n-dimensional hypercube and to each edge we associate, for example, a standard Gaussian random variable. So we think of this model as having two to the n IID Gaussians. And we are, and of course, in principle, this hypercube has a geometry and one might think that one could introduce a correlation structure among these Gaussians that takes into account the structure of this underlying graph, namely the hypercube, right? Um, and this is in some sense, the idea of this, of the continuous random energy model or the random, uh, or the generalized random energy model. So the generalized random energy model, which was introduced in a paper by Derrida and Gartner in the eighties, um, it is, the same as the random energy model in a certain sense, but we add correlations. So we take a graph with an edge set and a vertex set, for example, the hypercube drawn on the last slide. And we set the, we, we, we say we take H to be a Gaussian process with a certain covariance on the edges um, of our graph. Right? And what we want to say in the case of the generalized random energy model, we want that the covariance between the field at edge X and at edge Y is a function of the overlap. Or you might also think of this as a function of the distance on the graph. So what do we understand and as an overlap. Well, let me just explain this for now in our example of the hypercube. So we take the hypercube, um, and in, in this very particular example, it's just the three-dimensional hypercube. And what is the overlap? The overlap is the number of coordinates that coincide. So if we think of this hypercube really as minus, let's say minus one, one to the N, then each edge corresponds to a sequence of minus ones and ones. And if we have two such sequences with N entries, we can count how many of them are the same. And we can say this is the overlap. So in this very particular example here, X and Y, they only coincide in the last coordinate. So we can say that the overlap is one 
Or alternatively, we could also compute the Hamming distance between X and Y, namely the number of coordinates that differ, and this would be equal to two. So three minus one. So somehow the overlap is exactly the opposite of the distance. And in the generalized random energy model, this covariance function, right, in which we plug in the overlap is chosen as a step function of the normalized overlap. And in some sense, the continuous random energy model is now the same model, only that we allow this function sigma to be more general. Okay. And very briefly speaking from the point of, uh, of, to, of understanding spin glasses, what uh, Derrida and Gartner were interested in, in this type of models was, was in some sense, the description of the extreme values on the one hand, because these are somehow important states for the for spin glasses, right? If you are, okay, I will not go into this, but if somehow, if, you, if you're in the good in the temperature regime where your energy is really focused on the extreme values, then you need to understand the extreme values. And another point somehow is that that's very intriguing in this model is that you would like to understand the dependence of this function sigma that describes your covariance of, on the model, right? You want to know, does the description, for instance, of the extreme value depend really on this choice of sigma? And if yes, in which way, is there some universality, yes or no, right? For instance, are all these models the same and everything just looks as in the random energy model, which is the simplest model. Let me try to get a little bit more specific um, because on a general graph, it's really hard to understand these models. So what people like to do is they like to look at simple graphs where they can actually study these questions in detail. And a very nice graph to study these questions on, for example, is either the binary tree or um, what's also very convenient is any supercritical Gordon Watson tree. Because in the case of the continuous random energy model, um, if you look at, on, at this on the supercritical Gordon Watson tree, it's exactly the same as studying variable speed branching Brownian motion, which is, a, which is another stochastic process which has been intensively studied by now, but which somehow allows for a large set of tools. So the remainder of my talk will focus on this particular case, which is way easier than the hypercube because we are actually working on a tree and the tree structure really helps when you want to understand the extreme values. Right? And you will actually see in Maximilian's talk that if you deviate a little bit from the tree structure, you actually have to start working much harder. So let me start by telling you what a variable speed branching Brownian motion is. So first of all, what is branching Brownian motion? Okay, so the basic model we work with is the following. You take one standard Brownian motion, you start it at time zero at zero, and then you let it run for an exponential time, just according to this Brownian motion. Then it's going to split into two offsprings. Here it's the blue and the red one. And then each of those new particles are going to start behaving as independent Brownian motion starting from where they were born. And after an exponential time, each one gets their own exponential clock they are again going to split. So the red particle splits here into two particles and they perform independent Brownian motions from where they were born. And for instance, here, the blue particle decided to split and gets two offsprings and so on. Okay, so this is a particle, this is a particle system. 
um, that builds up a tree. And on this tree, we have a Gaussian process, namely this Brownian movement. Okay. And just to set up the notation a little bit more, um, at time t, we have a random number of particles because we don't know how many splittings there were exactly. So we're going to denote by n of t the number of particles. And due to our choices, it's important to keep in mind the expected number of particles at time t is going to be e to the t. And we will denote the particle positions in general by x k of t. And if we have two particles at a time t, we can also define their overlap. Okay, because we can take we can take them at some time and we can follow their path as backward in time to the root, and then they will meet at some point, right? And then the overlap is the time that they have spent together. Right. So also on the tree, we have a, on this tree, we have a very general idea um, of what an overlap actually is. And now, right, we could have also defined branching Brownian motion not by saying this particle does whatever it does, and then it splits, and then it splits again. But we could just say, take the tree that has been generated in this process of splitting, that is a binary continuous time golden Watson tree, right? So it's a binary tree where each branch is exponentially one distributed long. And we say on this tree, we define a Gaussian process that has mean zero and whose covariance is exactly given by the overlap. So what is overlap? The overlap is, is the time, if I take two paths of particles, it's the time they spend together. Right? So I take two particles, the purple one and the yellow one, and I can trace their path back to time zero. Mm -hmm. And then these paths have to meet at some point because I started from just one particle. Thank you. Right? And then the time they are together um, is the overlap. And it's again exactly the t minus the distance of the, of the two. And so we can define branching Brownian motion is the Gaussian process where the covariance is exactly given by the overlap in this particular tree. Right? So this corresponds exactly to the choice where the sigma function from before would be equal to one. Now we can define a larger class of processes, namely the variable speed branching Brownian motion as we take the same tree. And then it's a Gaussian process with mean zero. And now the covariance is, is actually a function of the overlap divided by the total time t and then scaled up again to time t so that the total variance is fine. And we say A is just some function that starts at zero, ends at one and is non-decreasing so that it gives us a valid covariance structure. In particular, one should note that the, if, if I look at the final time in, in this construction of variable speed BBM, the variance of each particle is still T. And if I just pick one particle, the, it, it, so each particle will, will look like a time inhomogeneous Brownian motion that at the very end has variance t. Right? So we have not, so this t here and t here um, make sure that the overall variance in time is normalized to be t, no matter which function a we choose so that we can actually compare the results. 
and just some examples. So the random energy model where everything is independent is what we would get if for A, we would pick the function that's always zero, except at the very end when it jumps to one. This means that we have number of leaves at time t, many independent Gaussians with variance t. Um, the standard branching Brownian motion, which has been studied for a long time, is what we are, can we can see it as a special case of this continuous random energy model, namely it corresponds to choosing the identity function. A of x is equal to x. The generalized random energy model is what we get if A is a step function. So something this form. And if we take a general function, people usually think of a general function as being something more continuous, we get the continuous random energy model. Right? And in this case, in this setting, somehow it was first studied by uh, Bouvier and Kurkova. And the typical questions one might be interested in in this specific type of model, and one is actually able to answer them in quite some detail in, in certain sub parts is, so it's kind of a hierarchy of questions. The first question one might ask is, what is the rough order of the maximum? What is you know the highest position at time t? Then one might ask, is there a more precise second order of the height of the highest particle? So this is somehow the first level of questions. The second level says, take the highest particle, subtract the order of the maximum that you have computed in one. Does this object converge in distribution to something that you can describe? That's the second level of question. The third level, somehow, can you describe all particles that are close to the highest particle, right? So that's what we understand as the description of the extremal process. And last but not least, you might wonder if you can actually describe things quantitatively. Okay. Because- Sorry, what is order of the maximum? Uh, it will become clear in a second. So this is something- Okay. So this is, this is something like, you know, if you have, um, Right. If you have e to the t iid Gaussians with variance t, right, then the maximum is roughly square root two t. And if you want to be more precise, it's like square root two t, one over two square root two t. I will say more why this is true in a second. But this is somehow what we understand of it. So the linear order and then the sublinear order of how fast the maximum goes in t. So to understand a little bit better what happens in this model, I want to take a, a small detour to the random energy model under the rough normalization of branching Brownian motion. Sorry, sorry, Lisa, just a question. So uh, what, when, when you put the, the covariance, somehow mm -hmm. you are only putting the variables at the end of the tree, no? You are not putting variables in the middle as in the branching random walk? I mean, there are also particles in the middle. Uh, okay, but the, so because the covariance was just both of them at time t. Yes, but you can all, so you can also do, okay, I, I mean, okay, I, I was a bit lazy there. You can also do it at any time. You can also partic put particles, you can take in between times um, as well and define it as an overlap. The only thing you need to be careful is if you look at this continuous random energy model, right? You, the final time horizon is set. So it's not a, it's not really a stochastic process that you can follow forwards in time, right? If you choose, if you change, so in this case, if you change the total time horizon, you build a new model, in a sense. Yeah. So this is what was bothering me, but but this is this is what happens. Yes. So somehow you cannot build it all the way through. Yeah, I mean you can build it, but then somehow you 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 don't really normalize your variance properly, right? Because, for okay. instance, if you take a function that, that says 
change the variance parameter in the middle of the time, right? Then if you change what's the middle of the time, um, then you have to change it, right? Okay. So if you run it then as a process, somehow you change the covariance profile with respect to the time frame, and that's usually not very comparable. I see. So in, in that okay. sense, it's not a stochastic process. Right. I mean, that's one of the reasons why in some senses branching bounding motion is a bit easier because there everything is a stochastic process. Mm, but for us, it's not going to be too important. So, okay, let me take a very small detour around the random energy model. So if we have E to the T independent Gaussians with the variance T, right? So this is exactly the variance Brownian motion has at time t, and e to the t is exactly the expected number of particles in branching Brownian motion, so it has the good normalization to compare. Um, if we want to compute the probability that the maximum of these IID random variables is below some little x, right? we can say, well, these are all independent, so if the maximum is below x, they all need to be below x. So this is equal to the probability that one of them, let's say the first one is below x to the power e to the t. Now, the probability that a Gaussian is below some value, assuming that this is a um, quite large value, this is one minus the probability that, first of all, this is equal to one minus the probability that x1 is larger than x, and now for this probability, I can use Gaussian tail asymptotics. So this comes from Gaussian tail. So I can use Gaussian tail asymptotics. asymptotics. Let's say that the probability that a single Gaussian with variance T is larger than some X is essentially E to the minus X squared over two T multiplied by a prefactor that is essentially one over X times square root of T and some constants. Right? So this is really just the standard Gaussian tail formula. Now, if I want this object here to be something, I want now to write this in such a way that I can say something about this limit behavior. So what do I do? Well, I multiply this last term that I had by e to the t and divide by e to the t, right? So now this looks almost like e to the minus something, right? Because I divide by e to the t here and I take a power e to the t here. If this thing that's circled in red is of order one, right? So the probability that the maximum is below X converges to a non-trivial limit if this expression is of order one, okay? So let's take it. And we want this to be of order one. Now, the first thing we see, this exponential and this X square over two T they are canceling out if x square is exactly 2t, right? So if x is something like square root two, uh, uh, so if x square is exactly square root two t, uh, if x is square root two times t, then x square is two times t squared. I divide by two t and then I get exactly t, right? So if x is just this, then these two exponential terms cancel exactly. Now to make this of order one, this square root two over X also need to disappear. So square root two over X, now for this choice, square root two over X is essentially a one over square root of T because X starts with a term that's linear in T. So I need to choose the second order of X such that 
the mixed term in the square cancels out a one over square root of t. And the term that I have to choose for this is exactly one over two square root two divided over one over two square root two. So the square root two is there because I, I multiply by this square root two, right? And then I need to cancel a one over square root. So I need a one half in front of the logarithm. So this is one way to see that the order of the maximum in the random energy model should be square root of two T minus one over two square root two log T. And that's good to keep in mind for comparison. So back to the gram. So it has been shown in <clears throat> for for standard branching Brownian motion, which corresponds to A being the identity, that the order of the maximum is actually square root two times T minus three over two square root two log T. So the first term is the same as in the random energy model, but the log correction is different. There's a three instead of a one. This goes back to work by Bramson um, at the end of the 80s actually. Uh, at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s. Okay, so, and in this particular case, if BBM has attracted quite a lot of attention because it's actually the part of the model that corresponds to a larger class of models, namely those of log correlated fields. So this will just be a very quick detour. Um, this is a class of models where this half correction, we call it in, in this second term of the maximum compared to the IID setting, appears in a universal manner. And also the way and the reasons for it to appear are always rather similar. And there's a, there are many models that fall in this larger universality class. Um, and it has been proven for many and uh, is conjectured for many more. Um, that they have this three as the second order of the maximum. So just to name a few examples, so branching random walk in, um, in a large class of uh, branchings, uh, branching distributions. Um, the two-dimensional discrete Gaussian free field is also uh, a very well-known model in this class, and Maximilian will uh, say a lot more in detail in the next talk. Um, other um, well-known examples are the logarithm of characteristic polynomials of some classes of random matrices, or also the Riemann zeta function in a random interval of length one on the critical axis. And, and there are many more. So let me maybe quickly say a few words on why the three appears. Um, I will be extremely brief on this, um, but I think that it's, it's good to understand this also to put everything else that I'm saying into context. So if we compare branching Gaussian motion to e to the t iid Gaussians with variance t, we match the final number of particles and the final variance one to another, right? The thing that we do not take into account is that in branching Brownian motion, at the beginning, we have a lot less particles than in the end, right? So at an intermediate time s, I only have e to the s particles on average, right? But if I have at time s e to the s particles, Right, and each of them are, ga are Gaussians with variance S, then on first order, as we have just seen, right, their maximum at time S only wants to be roughly square root of two times S, right? Because, I mean, I only have E to the S particles, how should they go larger than in the independent case? But this also means, right, if I take this into account in a BBM up to time T, that if I look at this whole model progressively, 
um, then there is going to be a curve of slope roughly square root two where the particles shouldn't cross. So if I'm rough here, right? So at a time in between S, right? If I say here S, at some intermediate time S, I only have E to the S particles. So the maximum should not really be above square root two S and I can draw this picture for every time point. If I now look at a particle that reaches in roughly height square root two T at the very end, then its curve from zero to this point has to stay below the red line. Right? Roughly speaking. But this red line also ends at square root two T. Right? So now imagine the following. You take this red curve and the blue curve below and you just turn it so that the end point is also at zero. Right? Then your picture becomes, you have this, I mixed up the colors, then your picture becomes, you have a straight line that you shouldn't cross. And you essentially have a Brownian motion underneath from one point to the end point that does not, shouldn't cross this straight line. So essentially, the path of an extremal particle is the path of a Brownian bridge from zero to the final position that is not crossing zero. And the probability of a Brownian bridge doing this, okay, and, and if I don't put the endpoints exactly at zero, is of order one over t. Right? That's the that's the famous Ballet theorem for Brownian motion. But if we take this into account and we just believe that you know our previous computation makes sense, well then we have an additional prefactor one over t from this event that we are not allowed to be too high in the middle, which is a one over square root of t squared times the one over square root of t that we already saw in the Gaussian tail formula. And together we have one over t to the three halves. Okay, and this can actually be ma made formal and this three that we get as a power here is really the three over two that we see in front of the logarithm. Okay. So the, the, so what you should take away from this is the three is there because there's a barrier that the path of extremal particles are not allowed to cross. And there's an extra polynomial cost for this not crossing. And in all these log correlated models, it's exactly one over the parameter squared. And in, in, the, in this case, somehow this parameter is the square root of t. Right? So you get exactly this, this three. Um, okay. Um, and having this picture of a barrier in mind will also help you in Maximilian's talk a little bit, because actually understanding Right, because we actually understand quite well what a Brownian bridge does when it's conditioned to stay below zero. But for now, that's not too crucial. Let me go back to the continuous random energy model. So I just told you that in branching Brownian motion, the correction to the maximum is a three over two square root two log t. And then the story continues. So if you take any function below the straight line, that's you know really below the straight line independent of t, then you see the logarithmic correction becomes the order of the maximum punk becomes exactly the one in the of the random energy model. So this extra phenomenon that you have to stay away from a barrier is not important anymore. And the answer to this question of the order of the maximum is really the same as in the random energy model. 
Right? So this was shown in, in, a, uh, in my PhD thesis together with Anton Bouvier. And then there was also um, a previous work by um, Fang and Saituni. And a very interesting case is actually the one where you take a covariance function that's more correlated than the one that you that um, than the the one in BBM. And there it has been shown by um, Pascal Meya and Ofer Zaituni what the order of the maximum is. And there the picture is very different. So there actually um, everything depends on the concave hull of the function that you choose. There is no longer a logarithmic correction, but a t to the one third correction. Um, and the uh, every function comes into play. So this is a very, there you get a very complex picture. And we also understand pretty well by now the transition at the straight line. Okay, so for instance, how, how you kind of can approach these lines and so on. Um, maybe let me not focus too much on this. Um, just to give you kind of the general picture, um, in, in this model also the extremal process can be studied and has been studied. So for branching Brownian motion, this goes back to paper by Agon Bogi and Kisla or um, Eidekon, Beristiki, Brunier, and Xi. Um, and also in this weakly correlated regime, it can be described. And in both cases, it turns out to be a randomly shifted decorated Poisson point process. And it's kind of interesting in the sense that the object that appears is universal. The only thing that you need to know is the slope of your function at zero and the slope of your function at one. Um, if you are above the straight line, if it's a piecewise linear function, you can also get what it is. And it's something like a cascade of extremal processes of branching Brownian motion. Um, and what is still open is the case of a of a general function that's more strongly correlated. Um, and let me maybe close with saying what's actually important if you want to understand the extremal particles in the continuous random energy model. A general thing, as you can might maybe guess from this derivation of, of this three, is that you really need to understand the typical path of an extremal particle or two of them, okay? Because um, what we actually like to do is work with first and second moments. So we really would like to understand, you know, where can extremal particles branch off from each other and where can they not branch off from each other? It tells us a lot about the genealogical structure and about the process that's actually behind these extremal particles. And in BBM and in this weakly, more weakly correlated regime, um, the phenomenon there is actually very similar. Namely, if you take two particles that are close to the maximal, to the maximal height that you can reach, then either they have branched off at the very beginning or they have branched off at the very end from each other and everything in between cannot happen. And this is something that changes dramatically if you move to this more strongly to the strongly correlated case. There, this idea of you only have two types of overlaps at the very end is different. And you expect the structure, the genealogy of your system to be much more interesting and not just having the zero and one. I know that I have overall now been extremely brief on these things, um, but I just wanted to give a little overview of what's known and what are the main uh, driving ideas. And now I would like to just use the last minute um, as a little teaser maybe on why this is connected to Maximilian's talk. 
So actually, one can also define the conti but but now you really, you know, don't look too much at the slides. Um, you can also define a continuous random energy model in the context of the two-dimensional discrete Gaussian free field, um, which is the so-called scale in homogeneous discrete Gaussian free field. Um, and essentially there you, you take the two-dimensional discrete Gaussian free field and you also, you change it in a way that the covariance is now again a function your choice of um, of your overlap, and now your overlap is somehow the logarithm of your normal distance minus oops, do this minus the logarithm of the Lockean distance. So it's exactly it's exactly somehow the total length in some sense minus the Euclidean length, only that now everything has to be on the log scale to match the model before. And then you can actually play exactly the same game as before, but let me just not get into that um, because actually Maximilian is going to talk solidly about the two-dimensional discrete Gaussian free field. Um, and he's not going to focus on this scale in homogeneous part, but he's actually going to focus on the um, on the normal two-dimensional discrete Gaussian free field. But then he's interested in a very detailed uh, analysis of the extreme values. And um, this is the end of my talk. Okay, thank you very much. Um, is there any questions? Okay, uh, uh, so I think there's Andre in the audience. Do you want to ask your questions and in person? Thank you. Yeah, it was a great presentation. Just shortly among the processes related, you mentioned few related to polynomials of random mm -hmm. matrices. Could you maybe expand on this topic, which uh, concretely are they related to? Thanks. Um, yes. Um, okay, let me maybe go back there. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. So, so the object actually, what's so the object <clears throat> that is looks like a log correlated object is the logarithm of the characteristic polynomial. Right. For instance, you can take um, the Geneva ensemble, or you can um, take uh, take a uni unitary ma a unitary matrix sampled from the Haar measure, right? And then you look at the characteristic polynomial that is a function that's a random function, and this polynomial, if you take so, right, so is a good way to explain this. Okay, so, okay. So the then- main, the, the, the main question, if I may just interrupt, is basically to which random matrices uh, this connects? Uh, is this some general, say, beta ensembles or any yes, other types so, of matrices? So, yes, so it also works for kind of general um, beta ensembles. Um, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, yeah. So, so it works for C, CUE, um, for instance, I mean, it works for a lot of these standard random matrices when you have a lot of IID entries. Um, but it also is conjectured to work for these, like, uh, for the class of column gases. Right? This is a uh, very expressive word of Sylvia Sefati and Thomas Leblay. It's also, this is also supposed to fall into this log correlated class. Um, but then you reach the point where it's proven for where, where these things on extreme values or the maximum are proven for just very few um, because the techniques are just not there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think this explains. Thanks. Um, any more questions? 
Um, so I have a short one. Um, so you mentioned, um, so one of the questions we can ask about these type of models is uh, um, you can look at uh, the so-called level sets for these extreme. Mm -hmm. So um, is there anything new about uh, the brand new motion of uh, the BBM or the year, uh, which is the or the generous model about extremal level sets. Um, so, so Maximilian is actually going to talk about the extremal level sets and the two dimensional discrete Gaussian free field. Um, okay. Yeah, so that might actually answer your question. Okay, okay. So I mean, we, wrote, we wrote this paper a few years ago about this about branching going motion, and the advantage of branching going motion is in the sense that. Because it's an exact tree, um, you can do a lot of things very explicitly without having too many technical problems. But even then, the paper turned out way more technical than we thought. Um, and Maximilian is somehow going to talk about the extension to the two-dimensional um, discrete Gaussian free field. Um, and, and if you want to go to other models for this question, I mean, yeah, I don't know, somehow, I mean, I think someone at some point said that, you know, if you go from the first order of the maximum to the second and then further in this hierarchy of questions that I mentioned that every time you go to the next step, uh, the, you can exponentiate the length of the paper that you have to write due to technicalities. <laughs> I see, okay. Okay, um, uh, Shai, I, I would like to invite everybody to amuse themselves and let's get a round of applause for Lisa for his wonderful job. Okay, so we have time for uh, a short uh, coffee break. So, and um, as Lisa mentioned, there will be a second talk uh, given by Maximilian. Uh, in just about, let's say, 11 minutes. Would that be fine? Yeah. Shall we, yeah. Uh, shall we resume in 